Law does come from the people, both Ireland and the United States democracies. Law comes from the people. It's for the people. The entire basis of the law is that it belongs to the people. Everyone should be treated equally within the system. That was Ruth Cannon, an Irish barrister, and she joins the Global Irish Conversation on this episode of Irish Stew. I'm John Lee. And I'm Martin Nutty, and welcome to the podcast. This episode of Irish Stew was brought to you by Murph Guide, the New York City nightlife website. Connecting the fun to the fun people. Visit murphguide.com. Well, Martin, uh, you know, we speak to each other from opposite sides of town, but uh, where are we going to go today and who are we going to talk to? Well, uh, from the other side of the town, uh, we're actually going to go all the way across the Atlantic to Dublin, and we're going to be speaking to Ruth Cannon. Ruth is a barrister, although um, I got to know Ruth um, surprisingly over Twitter. We share an interest. Uh, and I think it's actually an interest that you also share, John. Uh, we're into maps and old prints. And interestingly, Ruth periodically posts uh, various old prints of Dublin, and she posted one about Trinity College. And in the background of that print was what seemed to be the sea, and I hadn't considered that as a possibility. So apparently over, well, not apparently, over a course of two days, we had an exchange as to whether that was feasible and reasonable. And then we were talking about a church that was in the background. So we totally, at least I totally nerded out on this thing. And uh, it's a really delightful exchange. And um, once you get to know somebody on Twitter, you kind of wonder a little bit more about them. And I noticed in uh, Ruth's uh, Twitter handle, she had a link to what turns out to be a blog called Stories of the Four Courts which is a blog about history of the four courts, which is the main court in Ireland. And uh, so we got chatting a little bit about that. And I thought Ruth would be really helpful in explaining to me and you probably how the whole Irish legal system differs, at least from the legal system that we are exposed to in the United States. So. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ruth on to Irish Stew. We're delighted to have you, Ruth. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Martin and John. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you. So, um, also by way of introduction, I, I should have mentioned that uh, Ruth is a barrister, uh, which is a term that's actually not used uh, in the United States. We 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 call we refer a lot of times to people taking the bar. As a matter of fact, my wife is an attorney. Uh, we call them attorneys over here. From what I remember, they're lawyers in Ireland. But a barrister is a type of lawyer, as I understand it. And Ruth, I, I wonder, uh, there's also solicitors in Ireland. And I wonder if you could explain the distinction to the uninitiated here. Sure. Um, the big difference, I suppose, is that barristers tend to do the coursework. So, uh, you know, the process of advocacy, of arguing cases in court, you would usually use barristers for that. You might have some solicitors in the lower courts in what's known as the district courts here. But in, in most of the higher courts, you'd have barristers to argue the case in court. And because they're arguing cases in court, barristers would usually draft the court documents that are submitted prior to these cases being heard. We, we submit documents known as pleadings. Uh, which set out the case in defence, and they would usually be drafted by barristers. And you might also have a specialist counsel in certain areas who perhaps might give advice to solicitors who had more general practices and might require, you know, specialist assistance. You turn perhaps to specialist tax lawyers, specialist environmental lawyers, specialist property lawyers to provide that advice if perhaps you were a relatively small solicitor mm -hmm. uh, with a small practice and without access to expert advice within your firm. So a solicitor, uh, on the other hand, would tend to deal directly with the public and would, you know, the solicitor would be your first port of call then if you, if you needed advice. You'd go to the solicitor, for instance, if you were 
uh, making a will or if you had a difficulty, you wouldn't go directly to a barrister. But I've probably gone on a little bit further there. So no, no, that's um, good, Ruth, yeah. I, you know, because uh, my my knowledge of the subject is pretty much limited to Rumpole of the Bailey, that the uh, distinction between the barrister and the solicitor, which I imagine is similar in the UK and Ireland. I'm sure there's some differences. But uh, is there is there anything to those stories that ring true? Well, uh, I think it can be very entertaining and exciting, many court cases, you know, so uh, they're very interesting to watch. Uh, When I was a student, I was lucky enough to study in Trinity College, which is a great institution, and it's also not far from the courts. So, you know, every chance I got, I would go down and try and see the cases uh, in the courts, and they're really just fascinating to watch. Uh, so I suppose that that element, um, the rumpel of the Bailey element, the entertainment factor in court proceedings is, uh, is very, very um, um, real. You know, that's not exaggerated. But obviously you also have, and maybe what you don't see as much in films or television, you have the human elements. So these are cases in which people's lives are being hugely affected and that. So is perhaps a little bit deeper uh, and there's a more serious element perhaps than, you know, is portrayed in, in, in Rumpel. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you're affecting the trajectory of people's lives really. Uh, so judges have, you know, a huge responsibility in that respect. So um, you mentioned the fact that you were educated in Trinity College. And I know over the American side, at least for my wife, that, The usual kind of, if you will, educational curve that people pass through is they go to college and then from college, they apply to law schools. And then uh, once they finish up law schools, they take a bar exam and that makes them a practicing lawyer. What would be the equivalent in Ireland or how does that work? Is it the same kind of thing? You go undergrad because undergrad in America, you could study biology and then go straight to law school. I think it's a little different in Ireland. Is that correct? It is. I mean, in Ireland, uh, a lot of people who end up as barristers or solicitors would have gone straight from school into a law degree program, which would usually last about three or four years. And uh, most, if not all of the courses they take on that program would be law related. So their experience of university would be the experience solely of studying law. But that, that's not invariable. There are many different ways that you can come to law now. And I mean, you could come to law and become a barrister or a solicitor having worked in another area for many years. Alternatively, you could do a degree in something else at college and then go on and perhaps, you know, do a course in law afterwards, another degree or a diploma course and uh, qualify as a barrister or solicitor that way. But it probably is true that most barristers or solicitors would have done the law degree program, which means that their university experience would have been largely confined to law. Occasionally, you might do another subject with law. You might do a few business subjects, a few language subjects, but their, their university experience would be primarily law related, which, of course, is very different from the States where you would have a humanities or some other degree first. And uh, I mean, I, I can't decide myself if that's a good or a bad thing. I mean, I, I'm very much in favor of lawyers having, you know, as much life experience as they can in other areas, because I think it just it creates a deeper dimension in terms of understanding and dealing with clients. Uh, you, you, you can um, you can um, get a lot more out of the process for yourself. You know, you can it, it, you can understand it better and you can also uh Perhaps, uh, at least at the beginning, you have a slight advantage if you understand other things apart from law, because I think you can just bring a deeper dimension, though it does even itself out over time. But uh, at the moment, we don't have that here, no. So it is quite different uh, from from American that. And it would be really interesting, I think, to put American and Irish lawyers together to discuss that really and and try and debate and decide which, which approach is better. We'll have to host that, John, I think, going forward, you know, the battle of the attorneys, you know, our lawyers. Uh, you know, but, uh, Martin, I, just on that, you know, I, I've been meeting uh, quite a few lawyers lately who who practice in both uh, Ireland and the United States. And I, you know, I'll have to ask them how they how they navigate this. this Ruth, does your, your legal world take you into uh, international uh, 
cross borders at all? Um, and some of my colleagues, not my area of practice, mm-hmm. um, some of my colleagues would do international arbitration. Um, some of my colleagues would do European law, for instance. I mean, you know, we have a fantastic arbitration movement now in the Irish Bar, which is very well timed, I think, with COVID to try and, you know, increase the number of cases being dealt with by arbitration. So people involved in that would certainly have a lot of international movement. So, Ruth, um, can you tell me a little bit, you know, if we we kind of take a step back to uh, where you started from? Why law? Is this something that, you know, I think a lot of times in families, you'll see families of lawyers in other words, and you ask people, you know, why they became a lawyer. Well, because my daddy was a lawyer and my granddaddy was a lawyer, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. So that's one avenue. But are there people that are just, you know, maybe very grounded in the importance of law uh, from a political point of view, from a constitutional point of view? What was your driving or your impetus into pursuing a legal career? I suppose there were two things. Uh, First of all, I didn't come from a legal background. My parents are teachers, so that element wouldn't have been present with me. But I think the two things were, firstly, I liked the idea of studying law. uh, And I think it was primarily tied in with the historical element. It just seemed to me to be something that I kept coming across when I was looking at history, you know, as a hobby. And it was something that really, it was difficult to understand unless you immersed yourself in it and studied it. So I really liked the esoteric element to it, you know, the idea of mastering something that was not uh, generally available, you know, um, the arcane and esoteric element. And uh, what I also uh, liked about it was, especially the idea of being a barrister, is it just gave a certain level of independence, you know, And so as a barrister, for instance, I could be self-employed and yet I didn't have to have a large office or a large amount of staff. I could be self-employed with low overheads, um, which for me was, you know, something that was important in terms of independence, um, financial and other independence. And it was the kind of career as well that would allow me, you know, the ability to teach uh, and write also, which would be difficult in some careers. Mm. So I think all those elements, there was the practical element of what would work for me as a person going forward. And also, I think just, I suppose, what you'd call the spark of excitement, the the the, the, the quickening of the of the, the blood that the esoteric and arcane element uh, created, you know, the buzz. Uh, so I think it was those two things, really. And, yeah. I, you know, I suppose also, uh, you know, the sense that as a lawyer, you would have a certain level of control in terms of how uh, you navigated your way through society and the future, because you would know rules that otherwise could pe- potentially, you know, could trip you up or whatever. So the, the, those three things really uh, were the, the, the three things together, I think, that led to me studying law. Now, I noticed uh, when I was a... Uh... Uh, preparing for our chat, I took a look at your LinkedIn profile and saw that obviously you went to Trinity, but then you fetched up in Oxford after that. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that transition uh, yeah, and, and uh, where you went there and how that fit into your your overall picture? Well, I was lucky enough to be offered a place on the um, BCL, which is a taught master's course that Oxford offers. It's, it's a one-year taught master's course and you take a number of, of, of law subjects and, you know, you're examined in them at the end of the year. You don't do a thesis as such. It's a purely taught master's. But um, you get a lot of people from all over the world uh, choose to do it, you know. So you get to, to meet a lot of people from other countries who will be going back to those countries and probably working and working quite a high level in law in those countries. And I think you get to be taught by uh, fantastic academics um, who are really skilled in their in their their areas of expertise. Although, in fairness, I mean, I had fantastic academics in Trinity College as well, uh, so I was very lucky. But you know, I got to build on that further in Oxford. Um, so uh, that's uh, what you do. And uh, when you're at Oxford, you you would attend classes and you'd be under the academic supervision of the law faculty. But you would uh, live in uh, college. There's a number of colleges, different colleges in Oxford, most of them quite old. So you would live within the college and uh, you would have some tutoring work from 
from law lecturers who were based within that college. And you would also, uh, you know, uh, dine in the college, you'd be fed in the college, your living accommodation, there would be social life in the college, and then there would be also a social life within the law faculty generally. So a very interesting experience. I was at Lincoln College, which is a lovely college. And um, it also had a very good, um, a very good cook, which was nice. <laughs> I, I'm not really a foodie myself, but it was nice, you know, because uh, a very good way to meet people because everyone wanted to dine at Lincoln College, you know. So you, you know, you you could offer them an, an invitation to dinner, and you knew they'd accept. So, so that was nice. Uh, it, uh, it was a very good experience uh, in terms of meeting a variety of, of people from all over the world. And uh, there were some lovely people from Ireland over with me. And, uh, you know, that was really nice as well to have. I had the best of both worlds because I got to meet, uh, you know, uh, people from abroad. And, uh, you know, at the same time, I had people from Ireland there with me. So that, that was a lovely experience. Ruth, I, this is something new. I had not heard about the English university system, their fine cuisine. So we'll have to explore <laughs> that further, I guess, in, in, in some occasions. Uh, you know, look, you, you, I love that phrase of uh, the uh, arcane and esoteric. It could almost sounds like something from witchcraft. Uh, is, it's what, a form of magic. Yeah. It is a form of magic. Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, there was something that came up. If I could just kind of go off topic, there was one of the uh, lawsuits brought by the Trump administration, by the Trump election, uh, the, the endless series of lawsuits there to overturn the election. The judge complained that the shoddiness of the, I'll, I'll say the brief, I'm probably using the wrong term, but that it, it did not even have the necessary terms of incantation. Yeah. <laughs> is that is that something that you know sort of like which I took as the words you would have to put in a legal document to make something happen. I suppose happen. yeah I mean it, I, traditionally particular terms and particular phrases were very important so legal right. spells were created by the use of specific phrases and words so for instance if you wanted to transfer property in Ireland by deed, you had to have the words in fee simple in the document. If you didn't have those words in, you transferred a lesser estate. So you're absolutely right. I mean, the use of words was very important. Um, but I think nowadays law is moving a little bit more towards the intent and the purpose uh, so that, uh, you know, the use of particular phrases is maybe just a little bit out of date. I find the the litigation, the election litigation, just fascinating. You know, I mean, I've been following it and I've been following the Epstein case and they're so interesting. You know, it must be a very exciting time for America to see law as center stage for American lawyers, you know, to see these battles being fought out in the courts. And I think it's it's, it's wonderful that they're being fought out in the courts because that, after all, is the essence of a healthy system, you know, where cases can be brought and they can be determined by the courts openly. Because I think for me, the essence of the law is that everything should be open and nothing should be hidden, you know, because, uh, you know, um, why? Uh, and I think in Ireland, uh, you know, there have been a lot of things that happened perhaps that shouldn't have happened. And the law has been instrumental in bringing those things to the fore. So it'd be very interesting to see what happens with your cases in America. I, I yeah, certainly well, be watching them with interest. We're we're running out of time, so there's only about you know thirty days left or so for anything yeah, different all, to happen. All, right? all legal things always happen at the last <laughs> minute. We have a say here, you know, that things are decided on the steps of the court, uh, and that means on the day of the case. So you have cases that run and run and run, and nothing happens, and then suddenly you know you achieve a settlement or a judgment. So nothing happens. It all seems very slow, and then it all happens. So be interesting to see if it ha anything happens before inauguration day. Uh, you know, you, you kind of got into an area that that was I was originally going <laughs> to ask you about, not so much our our legal trauma, right, uh, that we've been going through here, but you know, you're kind of getting into some of the new ideas in the mm. law, the new things you're seeing. Yeah. What, what what's new and exciting, uh, or even new and concerning in the legal profession in the law frontier in Ireland? Well, I, I think there, there. I think the law in Ireland is going through a fantastic process at the moment because 
what we have, and I think it's probably true worldwide, is we have a far better educated public than we ever had in the past. So in the 19th century stories that I wrote about, you know, you have a very small uh, group of people, perhaps, who are defining the law and they're quite a closed class. And most of the people who come into the courts as litigants are completely confused. and They don't understand anything about the process. And in fact, when I started at college, I mean, you know, although people were certainly, you know, educated to a level where they were capable of understanding the law, they could read and write. And secondary education was such that if they were given a law book with a bit of effort, they could probably understand it. Law books just weren't available. I mean, they weren't available in the public libraries. You know, uh, you had to go to the university library to get most of the law books. You had to get these big, dusty law reports down from the shelves. Um, and now, I mean, you can just click and I mean, I can teach my students, I can tell them, you know, and they can click on their computer and they can get all the law reports and read them. And what has amazed me really in terms of the teaching is that since stuff has become available, it's amazing how easy, you know, how quickly my students pick up stuff like people who would never have studied law can, you know, I can, I, I can, I can give them something to read and, you know, you think you can never get their heads around that judgment for the next tutorial, and they can. It's extraordinary. So I think what we're in is a process, really, where people, the law has suddenly become something that people can relate to. And in terms of actually understanding how it works and having an opinion on it, perhaps for the first time ever. And we're also, I think, getting to another situation, which some people would say is troubling, but I think is is not troubling at all. I think it's a process and I think it's a fantastic process of loss of deference because people would have been very deferential to lawyers uh, in the past. And now it's kind of swung to the other extreme and people are kind of very cynical and skeptical of them. And I hope that an accommodation can be reached where, you know, um, there is mutual respect uh, for one another. And the disempowerment, I think, that people felt in relation to law in the past and that carries over really in the resentment of lawyers today can be uh, dispelled because, you know, law does come from the people. I mean, both Ireland and the United States are democracies. Law comes from the people. It's for the people. The entire basis of the law in both jurisdictions is, you know, that it is, belongs to the people of the of the jurisdiction in question. So it, it should be accessible to people. And, uh, you know, uh, everyone should be treated equally within the system. And we should also be prepared to understand that with the process of change, you know, things happen that may unsettle us at first. And at the same time, we have to kind of approach change positively and be open to it, you know, because, uh, it, you know, so I think it's a very exciting time. And I see the future in entirely positive terms as far as law goes, you know. I, I'm, I'm glad to be around for it. Interesting. It's kind of interesting you mention, let's say, the naivete or let's call it ignorance that people would have had of the legal process in times past. Uh, my one and only trip to the forecourts within the actual building itself, uh, I had a friend who was in some trouble and he had to go uh, for a hearing. And I was fascinated as a 19-year-old to actually go into the courtroom and see all these bewigged uh, barristers in action along with the judge. Um, I do remember there, there was a variety of cases being presented and uh, one rather inebriated gentleman was testifying on behalf of his son that uh, was accused of battery and referred to the justice as your majesty, <laughs> um, which is, is still something that kind of resonates with me. But that, that aside, uh, I just want to kind of step back a little bit and talk about um, you went to Oxford, but then obviously you chose to return to Ireland. I'm assuming that was part of the master plan. But at that point in time, even with all these qualifications, with a degree in law from Trinity, a uh, master's degree from um, Oxford, at this point, you're still not a barrister, right? Because there's additional hurdles that have to be jumped. Are you a solicitor at this point or no. where do you stand in the legal profession? I, I'm just somebody with a law degree. So when I mm -hmm. returned from Oxford, I was studying at King's Inns, which is the Honourable Society of King's Inns in Dublin, where the barristers trained for two years. And uh, during that time as well, I was doing a little bit of teaching because I knew, you know, I had supported myself on scholarships. My parents have been very good, but I didn't want, obviously, to 
impose on them too much financially. So I'd been supporting myself with scholarships through uh, Trinity and through Oxford, uh, the Chevening um, uh, Foundation, the British Council, uh, gave me a scholarship to Oxford, which was great. And um, I, you know, I when I was at King's Inns, I was teaching as well. So I started with tutorials, then I started lecturing, uh, you know, uh, in, in in law. Uh, so I was doing that, and I was studying at King's Inns. And uh, it, two years later, really. Uh, when I suppose I would have been probably, I would have been about um, seven years since I started studying law. I was called to the bar, uh, but that was, the process was not complete at that stage because when you start practicing as a barrister in Ireland after you are called to the bar, that's, that's the phrase we use when you finished your professional training, you have to devil with a more senior barrister for a period of nine months or so. It's a year, nine months to a year. And um, you uh, have to follow that senior barrister around and assist them with their work. And in so doing, uh, gain a practical understanding of how, how, how the legal system, how the bar, the bar works and the, the tasks of the barrister and the courts. So it was, I suppose, probably eight years before I had my, my first case on my own, you know, from starting law, which is a long time. Uh, but then I was very young when I started. I was 16 when I went to college. So you know, uh, I might have been mature enough before then, but it is a long process. It's a bit shorter now, I think, you know, um, because you can do King's Inns in one year now, and uh, but it's a long process. So explain, uh, I have a couple of different questions, again, coming from my position of ignorance. Um, explain to me, you refer to King's Inns, you refer to, I think you said the term devil, or? Devil, uh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> that, that struck me as being particularly esoteric. Very. So can you tell me a little bit, uh, you know, obviously people sitting over this side might not be familiar with King's Inn, uh, exactly what that is. Well, the, the, the benchers of King's Inns effectively were responsible for all of the legal training in Ireland originally. And then they, the, the solicitors had, were set up in the 19th century and they developed their own legal training system. But uh, the, the King's Inns, the, the benchers are, are, are uh, responsible for the education of, of, of young barristers and trainee barristers. And what exactly the bencher? Uh, a bench, the benchers are made up of judges and also some senior counsel who would be very eminent barristers in the Irish courts would be would be benchers. Uh, okay. So, so I suppose what you you know the most eminent members of the legal profession is probably how you describe them. They're elected, or they they they're not elected as such. They 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 decide if new benches should be appointed. And so, when you study in, in King's Inn. Um, is there kind of like the equivalent of a bar examination like we have over on this side of the Atlantic? Or is it, how do you get, you say you get called to the bar. Um, what's the trigger event that makes that happen? Is it just simply completion of a course of study? You, you do you do a, a year's course of study during which you various exams, oral and written, and assignments. The the training is more intense now than it was in my day. <laughs> we just did exams at the end of the year. I think the students now have exams and assignments constantly throughout the year. Okay, mm-hmm. Ruth, uh, as you're going back, you know, you're talking about your education, your early years. Uh, are, are there any memories that really stand out about your first case or the first time you were responsible uh, as, as a barrister and, and and doing what a barrister does? Do you have any any kind of thoughts about that that first time out there? Oh, just sheer terror. I mean, uh, absolute and utter terror. I used to get sick before every case for about uh, three or four years. You know, it takes a while before you start to enjoy it, you know. But I always knew that I would enjoy it at some point when I knew what I was doing properly. Um, but it took a long time. It's it's extre- extremely nerve wracking standing up in court, you know, uh, with people uh, observing you. And, uh, you know, especially when you don't really know what you're doing very much at the beginning, you know. Um, although the training for young barristers is so good now that I think the young barristers coming in are just fantastic and they really do know what they're doing. But uh, certainly, I mean, I, I was a little at sea at the beginning, as I think most people were. It was a very nerve wracking process. And I think possibly 
than 20 years ago, I think, you know, was much more terrifying because, um, you know, the deference was much greater. And uh, we, 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 you know, you, the, the feeling of shame if you if you did something wrong was intense. But I think now there's a much healthier attitude in terms of, you know, um, people coming in and the learning process and the fact that they're on a learning curve. So, you know, it, there's less terror, I hope. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, the the uh, young barristers that I've seen, the people who've dabbled with me over the last few years have been fantastic and really, really good. What, was there a, a kind of a, a, a point where it went from sickening to fun? I mean, was there sort of oh, like yeah, you realized? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I suppose when you win your first case, I mean, that's exciting, you know, but it's not really so much about winning, I think, as achieving a good result for the client and often that can be achieved by settlement uh you know uh, so in many cases it is better to try to settle the case in a way that is beneficial to the client rather than run it and win because if you win there could be an appeal and you might not be successful on the appeal and also in a settlement you know you can achieve things which are outside the scope of what the court can actually order often you know, and also, particularly if, say, if the parties are neighbours or family members, a settlement can much, be a much healthier resolution of the dispute than, uh, you know, uh, triumphant victory for you, but possibly something that might have, you know, negative repercussions for your client going forward in terms of their relationship with those persons. So, yeah, it is very exciting when you're winning your first case, you know, but it, I think what what really satisfies me is, you know, uh, when I know that the, the client is satisfied with what I've done, that the client appreciates that I've done a good job. That that to me is the real satisfaction. You know, um, what you said earlier about the cases being decided on the courthouse steps or, or, or something, you know, the cases being settled on the steps, whatever your term was there. Uh, you know, I've served on American juries and you're often uh, waiting out in the hallway, the uh, the pool, and they're going to select 12 people out of that pool, there's 50, 70 of you perhaps, and you're waiting in the hallway to go in to hear, I guess it's called the voir dire process. Yeah. And then a half hour later, somebody will come out and say, you can go. They've, it's been settled. So, you know, like with the potential jurors lined up outside the door, things were still going on and they were able to come to a settlement without going to trial. Yeah. I mean, I, I think sometimes, you know, I think sometimes just the act of seeing the other side can put things in perspective. You know, you see them, you feel worried. They look worried. You know, they're human, too. Then I think sometimes people are just nervous of testifying and, you know, they <laughs> they do anything rather than get up and give evidence. And, you know, but I think it's more than just that. It's more than terror. I actually think that as human beings, you know, when they see their opponent, often they realize, you know, that the, there, there, there is room for a compromise that, you know, the person that they built up in their mind, perhaps, as, 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 as some kind of monster is actually, you know, uh, somebody who, who, who is not quite as bad as they thought. And then I think per perhaps common sense prevails. I think a lot of the law is just about common sense, which is why, you know, it's, it's, it's so wonderful, I think, that it's, it's accessible to people because, uh, you know, it, there's a lot in it, I think, in the law that resonates with anyone, whether they've legal background, whether they've legal experience, you know, I, 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 I um, talk, uh, you know, when people hear I'm a lawyer, they often ask me legal questions and I talk about it with them, with them. And certainly Irish people anyway, you know, they've an innate understanding of common sense and justice and how it works, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're, they're, it's wonderful, you know, just to see more information exchange. And, uh, you know, hopefully Irish people can realise that we have a very rich uh, legal history that belongs to everyone in Ireland, you know, uh, rather than a division and that you know, the law is something which is 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 accessible now and will become more and more accessible to people so that any division between lawyers and the public is something that will no longer exist. I, I really hope that happens. And I believe certainly in Ireland um, it, 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 it will happen. Just before we kind of move on to the next section, I, I figure I just have to come back to the arcane and the old and uh, to get a clarification on deviling with a lawyer. Where exactly does that come from? I'm assuming it means to shadow or be taught by or something like that. But do you have any sense of that? 
Well, the origins of it are somewhat murky, as you might expect from a term like devil. But uh, it, it, there is a term printer's devil, and it may be related to that. It, it, it tends to be used in Ireland more than in England. They tend to use the term pupil in England. But what is very interesting is that in Dublin, uh, there was a nickname for the four courts, not the current four courts building, but the old four courts that were situated on the other side of the river beside Christchurch Cathedral. And that was known as hell. They called it hell. And there was actually a mm. statue of a devil which uh, stood at the entrance. I'm not quite sure where it ended up. I have my theories. Maybe I'll track down the statue someday. But, it, it, you know, the nickname for it was Hell, the old courts of justice in Dublin. So perhaps the term devil uh, came from that. Who knows? So from what I understand, a printer's devil is somebody that usually uh, set the type, I think. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's it. Your understanding? Uh, and so I guess it could mean assistance, but I, I think it might have been a play on words. I, I, I like your theory. But um, that kind of takes us to... Um, talking a little bit about uh, your blog, uh, specifically, uh, it's called Stories of the Four Courts, so if listeners want to Google, you can find this, but um, it struck me as being unusual uh, that a barrister would be uh, running a blog. I'm sure you're not the only one, but um, I was wondering what kind of drove you to get involved with that, because I imagine you're pretty busy as it is. I'm very busy, uh, but um, I suppose in my work, um, I can't talk about the specific area I work in, but in my work, I often have to do research, you know, with newspapers um, for various, various things, you know, for stuff I'm tracing. And um, as part of that, um, I would have accidentally come across stories about barristers and judges and the four courts. And as I've been doing this for 20 years, I tend to just save the stories when I find them and put them in a file, you know, and I, I never really got around to sharing them. So I thought when I had a bit of extra time during lockdown and also, you know, when we couldn't get into the four courts during lockdown very much and I knew people would be kind of missing it uh, and missing the gossip and stuff. I thought it might be nice to just put those up and share them around. I share them on LinkedIn. And then I thought, well, there's a lot of people who aren't in LinkedIn, but they're people, they're on Twitter. But I can't do the posts on Twitter because they wouldn't, you know, they'd be too big for a tweet. So I thought what I'd do is I'd, I'd set up the blog and just link the Twitter posts to that. So, so that's how, how it happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, I enjoy doing it a lot. I, I must say, I didn't think I'd enjoy doing it as much, you know, and I certainly didn't think I'd get to 141 posts, but there's just so much material there. It's great. And, you know, my colleagues tell me they're enjoying it. So, uh, you know, I'll keep doing it for a bit until they stop enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I enjoyed uh, flipping through uh, some of the stories. I saw you posted one um, just a couple of days back about a, um, a gentleman by the name of a Mr. Smith that was engaged in a duel the night before he was to be admitted to the bar, if, if I read it correctly. And uh, Mr. Smith fortunately prevailed in the, in the duel, but I don't think it was very good for his legal education. And uh, oh, no. this is all the way back in 1717. How do you track down something like that? Or where did you come across it? There's a wonderful uh, website uh, called British Newspaper Archives, which is a a fantastically quick uh, search facility and a very inexpensive subscription. Uh, So, I mean, uh, you can search there for all the British and Irish newspapers from the 18th century onwards. And we don't have a huge amount of 18th century newspapers in Ireland, but there is a very interesting publication from the early 18th century called Pew's Occurrences. And uh, it was one of the stories in that. So I think how I usually find the stories is I usually just Google uh, solicitor, barrister, uh, always a good one is kind of heated scenes in court that tends to get up the, <laughs> that tends to get up the, the, the best uh, fun in court. Uh, extraordinary. If you key in solicitor, barrister, extraordinary into that database, you'll bring up stuff, remarkable things like that. So I suppose I must've been just messing around. I usually, I, I let the universe, you know, if I'm looking for a post, I just let the universe help me find it. I just key in something into the search thing, you know, involving law. And it usually brings something interesting up. So I guess that's how I found that one. 
you know, I, I, I poor Mr. Smith, you know, his father was, I think, an innkeeper a, a close to the courts. And I think the, the, the chap he killed was a gentleman's son. And I would suspect that's how he ended up with a manslaughter verdict against him. I think if he had been a gentleman's son too and had killed someone in a duel, they probably wouldn't have bothered, um, you know, having a verdict of manslaughter against him. He would just have got off scot-free. So um, I hope his all his work as an apprentice w- wasn't derailed. I couldn't find anything about him afterwards. I, I don't know if he was allowed to practice as a solicitor afterwards. But uh, it seems very tragic. I should be equally sorry. In fact, I should be far more sorry for the poor gentleman who was killed, you know. But <laughs> um, I, yeah, just something about the fact it was the day before Mr. Smith was called seemed to make it particularly poignant for him, even though he was the one who survived. You know, and speaking of, of lawyers getting themselves into dueling trouble, um, I don't know. I assume it's reasonably well known, but it was a relatively new fact to me. Um, Daniel O'Connell, who is, of course, also referred to as the great liberator, was also involved in a duel. And I believe he himself killed a man, but doesn't seem to have paid the same kind of price uh, legally that Mr. Smith did. No. Um, he obviously no. went on to greater things. Well, I think he really regretted it, and I think he paid the the man's widow a pension for the rest of her life, or paid her money, looked after her financially. Um, I I'm not sure he was the instigator of the the duel in that case. You see, the thing was, if you if you were asked to fight a duel and you refused, you were kind of goosed because you were seen as a coward and your honour was infringed. I mean, uh, uh, Daniel O'Connell was just a great example of somebody who actually affected change in Ireland through the law. He he was one of the first Catholic barristers, and uh, there was a huge amount of prejudice against Catholics um, in the early 18th century. And, uh, you know, it's to the credit of the Irish bar that it, you know, accepted Catholics and that they became part of the bar and, you know, uh, eventually, before long, they were would, were judges as well and senior counsel. And I think Daniel O'Connell was part of that. So it was a, a good example, I suppose, of political. She's a good example of political change being affected by the courts rather than by riots and so forth. So that's interesting in the context of uh, your situation in the states at the moment. Uh, that's a really interesting perspective, Ruth. Um, the first, the first blog post of yours that I looked at, I love the look of the uh, blog and you know great uh, illustrations all throughout, so it kind of pulls you right through. Uh, but was and I think it fits in with what's come up in our conversation a few times here in terms of language. The sort of you share stories of the shocking uh, uh, evidence of vernacular and slang being used in the courtroom. Words, you know, things like turning up, good golly, Jehoshaphat, and then even American slang, double cross, give them the works that were cropping up to the chagrin of the legal system. I, that was a great a great story. Any, any other uh, observations from that one? I, I, I suppose it goes back to what you said, which is very interesting. And I'm going to have a long think about that, about the use of words as incantations. And I suppose the thing is that incantations, too, can change with time and words can change with time. So, I mean, the 19th century was a big adjustment because you had the popular press and then you had the use of slang in the popular press. And then you had the movies in the early 19th century. So you get the American movie slang coming in. There was a big discussion by a judge about what a mug meant, you know, saying someone was a mug, which, of course, would come from America and the movies. Uh, So, I mean... Word, you know, the law is kind of magic and legal language and language used in the courtroom is almost like a spell. But I don't know, maybe spells don't change as much as language, but certainly the language of the courts does change over time. And, uh, you know, in Ireland, uh, the composition of the legal profession would sim- similarly have changed over time. So it's constant adaptation, really. I mean, it, the, 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 uh, the fact that we wear a very, uh, uh, you know, a costume that has been worn for centuries it almost conceals the fact that the law and the legal profession is extremely adaptable and receptive to change. And in fact, has been changing, almost hidden behind the things that appear static. You know, it has constantly been changing and adapting. But, uh, you know, uh, there is always at the point of that change, there are, uh, people, there are concerns and there is 
reaction to the change and criticism of the change. So, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the post you mentioned illustrates that. Yeah, it's, it struck me. The sense I took from that is is almost like, uh, let's say, certain justices found it offensive. This, you know, new fang- new fangled language being introduced into the court instead of you know proper language, uh, and certainly, you know, I was often berated uh, in my earlier days for use of slang. But um, it was interesting, you, you kind of refer to the fact of the kind of dress that's required in court. Now, I also saw a post that you had about uh, uh, the wig maker of Aaron Key. Yeah. And I, I understand that wigs are no longer required in Irish court, but they were certainly there in the 1980s. Um, and it, my recollection of that was being surprised that it existed in Ireland, because I always associate the wigs with British law and British justice and, you know. Yeah, they- yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's that's fascinating. And in fact, there was a discussion, I think, in, about whether or not the the, the uh, garments of lawyers should change around 1922 when, uh, you know, we, we got our independence. But uh, the... the um, the the system there was very little change in the actual structure of the legal system, uh, you know, uh, with the Irish Free State, and that we didn't really get significant, ch- you know, in terms of the day to day operation of the courts. I mean, sure, we had a constitution of the Irish Free State, we were independent with a much greater degree of sovereignty, but the actual structure of the courts didn't change that much, and the uniform didn't change that much. Uh, the composition of the bar did change hugely, though, because we lost, obviously, the the, the Northern Ireland bar, and then a lot of uh, barristers left and went to England as well. So we we had a much smaller uh, bar with a much higher percentage of Catholics than previously, and a lot of the traditions were lost as part of that, which was, uh, you know, sad in a way, but part of the process of change. But it's nice to remember them now. Uh, but I've, I've kind of gone off track of it. So if you could just direct me back, your question was, uh, you were surprised, I think, that the that we were still wearing the wigs. Um, I think it's a partly the beauty of the wigs, you know, I mean, they're, 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 they're incredibly picturesque, you know, when you see a lot of bars just together, the, the black gowns and the wigs in the actual four courts, it's, it's, it's really a visual feast, you know, uh, like some kind of exotic animals uh, with plumage. But uh, I mean, the difficulty is, I think, that 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 the wig tended to separate uh, barristers from the public, and you know, to create a, a division really uh, from between the law and the public. And also, you know, they were hot to wear in summer, and you had to remember to carry them around. And I, I was, they were still in when I started in 1999. I was obviously losing mine. So, um, you know, I think they, they are still used in, in criminal cases or certain criminal cases, but they, they wouldn't be worn that often in the civil courts now. I mean, they're optional. You can wear them if you want to. I, I like the gown myself because I think to me the gown, you know, is everyone is equal before the law. You know, it doesn't matter whether you, you know, what you're wearing or that. You don't get judged on what you're wearing. You just have the gown over it and you put on the garment of the law. And uh, that, so I think it's kind of a respectful, uh, a respectful thing to wear the gown. And I don't think it, it, it I don't think the, the public, you know, find it quite as intimidating or frightening as the wig. I mean, it must have been very frightening to be cross-examined, for instance, by somebody wearing a wig, you know, uh, particularly if you weren't used to the legal system, it must have been quite intimidating. So, uh, you know, I mean, I can't say that I would like the wigs to be mandatory again. I like the idea of people having the option, but I, I, I don't think I'd like to lose the gown. I think it's quite handy, you know, because it allows people to find you as well as a barrister. It's it's handy to be able to identify and find other barristers if you're looking for them. Uh, so that, that would be my view on the uniform. Ruth, uh, where does one acquire a good wig these days and how much does a wig set you back? Oh, well... I'd say it's probably about six or seven hundred euros now. I mean, I last bought mine in 1999 and I think it was 400 pounds then. So it must be seven or eight hundred euros now. I mean, I, 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 as far as I remember, people used to come over with the wig and, and sell them to people. I think there are English firms who, who, who sell them. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you can get your gown from Louis Copeland's in Dublin, which is a men's, a men's, um, 
uh, clothing establishment not far from the Four Courts. I don't know if they have wigs too. I don't think so. Um, but uh, I don't know if, pe- stu- if people buy wigs now. I mean, if you're starting at the bar, obviously, you know, your finances are at a premium. So if it's not compulsory to wear them, why would you invest 800 euros or so in, in them? You know, so that might be a moot question now. I'm not even sure where my wig is now. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Fervently looking for the wig <laughs> post the podcast interview. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I, I noticed you you had a post about um, Avril Deverell, who I think is, you know, I guess a seminal figure um, in the Irish law, especially if you're a woman. And I'm curious about... Uh, she is the first woman, from what I understand, that was called to the bar in Ireland. And I'm curious about uh, how egalitarian the profession is uh, at this point in time. And she is she, she struck me as being a fascinating figure because she was an ambulance driver in World War One. She was, you know, uh, obviously made, carved out a great career, you know, doing a lot of what I see, what looks like labor law and stuff like that. And she also wrote opinions, and, and that seemed to be an important uh, facet of, you know, her resume, so to speak. But I, I'd be curious, A, to, in, to hear a little bit more about her, and B, your, your kind of opinions on, you know, where the law is via V, uh, you know, uh, women and access to the profession. Well, uh, she, I think she was she was the first practicing woman barrister in Southern Ireland, and uh, there were quite a few women who were called as barristers, and uh, in the period uh, in, in the period uh, before the Second World War, but not many of them managed to remain in practice. So Avril Deverell was unusual in that she managed to maintain a practice. And um, I mean, uh, we're lucky enough, she practiced uh, primarily in Wicklow, um, south of Dublin, and we were lucky enough to have very full reports of some of her cases in the local newspapers in Wicklow. And you can certainly see that she was extremely tenacious in cases, while at the same time being respectful to the judge. So she was, you know, she she clearly had, um, you know, she clearly had, uh, you know, both determination and considerable practical skills and uh, ability to uh, deal with people and manage people. And uh, I expect that that explains how she managed to stay in practice. She also didn't marry, which might have been crucial as well, because I would expect that then as now, it probably is difficult. It was would have been very difficult to maintain a practice if you were married and had, had, had children. I mean, uh, now, obviously, it is more manageable, though still tough. But uh, in those days, I would say it would have been next to impossible. So I think a lot of the, the women barristers who qualified, we lost them effectively on marriage. And then 20 years later, you have their daughters coming down as barristers and being welcomed by the courts who say, well, we your mother here, you know, 30, 20 or 25 years earlier. But the mother was no longer practicing. So I, I, she also had a, a business on the side, which can be helpful, you know, when you start at the bar. I think she she bred dogs as well. She she So she was obviously quite astute financially and a little bit older going down to the bar. You know, she would have been in her, her, her late 20s, I think. So, uh, you know, had that life experience and ability to manage uh, practice. But it, I'm sure it was difficult for her, you know, um, it, it, I would imagine it, it must have been difficult in, in, in dealing with clients and solicitors who perhaps felt they were taking a risk in employing a, a woman barrister. But she seems to have been very good from the reports for cases. You know, she really seems to have been very, very astute, determined and brave in terms of her, her, her desire to do her best for her client and to brave the wrath of the judge on occasion, if necessary, in order to do that. Ruth, I'll just I'll just uh, skip to, to a completely different topic. And but back to back to your your blog post when I when I'm reading the story of this old you know facility of the four courts, my mind goes to there must be some good there must be some good ghost stories. <laughs> There's no ghost stories in the actual four courts uh, themselves, uh, but there are a few ghost stories about deceased judges in particular. 
And I think there was one poor judge who was supposed to be a very nice man, and he was unfortunate enough to be killed in the Emish Rebellion in the early 19th century. There was a rebellion uh, led by a barrister, in fact, Robert Emmet, and um, uh, Lord Kilwarden, who was the, 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 an important judge at the time, was unlucky enough to be traveling in his coach in the city center. And there were riots on the street and he was dragged out of his coach and he was killed. So it was terribly sad. But to make matters worse, uh, the horses, after he had been dragged out of his coach, the horses on the coach, the horses started galloping back to his house in panic. So his poor wife, uh, you know, was met with this coach with nobody in it and two panicked horses. And then she was met with the news that her husband was dead. And that was all at their home, which was Newlands Cross outside Dublin. And uh, subsequently, a legend grew up, uh, a legend of a phantom coast coach that this particular judge's coach would gallop at night, you know, uh, nobody in it and these ghostly horses would gallop back to Newlands Cross. And the legend is still there today. I mean, I know people who are members of Newlands Cross, which is now a golf club, and, uh, you know, they know the legend of the coach. So it's still going round. Um, and then there's another judge who was Lord Norbury, who was uh, quite a character. And he actually was involved in the trial of Robert Emmett and was quite unpopular as a result of it. And he was quite idiosyncratic in court. Uh, people said that his uh, being in his court was like watching a theatrical performance. Uh, but uh, should justice be a theatrical performance? I don't know. But uh, in any event, uh, when he died, there were rumours that he uh, had reappeared in two different places, his townhouse and his country house outside Dublin as a large black dog. So uh, one of our judges, a large black dog, apparently <laughs> roaming the streets of Dublin at night. And another judge um, uh, is not a ghost as such, but uh, his carriage is a phantom carriage uh, galloping around uh, the roads of West Dublin. So who knows, you know, so that's two judges, but they'd be, they'd be uh, a long time gone now. They'd be early 19th century. So no more recent judicial ghosts that I've heard of. <laughs> okay. Um with that ghostly uh, <laughs> anecdote, uh, I think uh, it's unfortunately come time to say uh, we need to wrap up. But I'd like to thank you for uh, uh, educating and elucidating. Um, I feel like I have a better grasp, at least, of the legal profession and how it operates and how people become barristers and what their role is in Ireland. And it's been a uh, really enjoyable and, and talking a little bit about the history of the four courts itself. And uh, if anybody ever goes to Dublin, uh, if any of our listeners go to Dublin, I can't recommend uh, going to take a look at the building. And I believe you can actually go into the building itself and actually sit in on court cases that are not being held in camera. So there is an actual an opportunity to kind of see the Irish legal profession uh, up close and uh, also enjoy the splendid architecture that is the four courts. And uh, right next to it is the King's Inn where the uh, barristers get educated. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing that again. It's been a long time since I've been there, but uh, I figure next time I'm in Dublin, uh, I'll be paying a visit. Thanks a lot, Ruth. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things that I didn't expect we'd talk about. And I'm sure you didn't expect to be telling ghost <laughs> stories at the end of this. Thank you very much. And just to say one thing, obviously, that anything I've said is just myself personally, and I don't speak on behalf of other barristers or a professional organization, the Bar Council. So just to, to say that, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you both. Uh, thank you very much. Ruth, uh, one thing we like to do uh, with all of our guests is offer them the chance of maybe an American slang here, a shameless plug. You know, anything you'd like to uh, direct the, the listeners to that you're particularly interested in? Uh, We'd love to hear it. We'd love to help. Uh, great. Well, I'm not involved in this myself, but the Government of Ireland has a great project called Ireland for Law. And it's uh, designed to encourage people um, who are interested, for instance, in choosing a jurisdiction for contracts and international dispute resolution to choose Ireland. 
uh, as that jurisdiction because we are the only English speaking common law jurisdiction in the European Union at the moment. So if for people who are interested in uh, choosing jurisdictions to have contracts and international disputes resolved, I, I would encourage you to check out the irelandforlaw.com website. It's an Irish government website. If you just Google Ireland for law, you'll, you'll find it. It's a very good website. And uh, I think, uh, you know, um, it's the suggestions on it are, are maybe of interest to some of your listeners. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ruth. Uh, we'll be sure to include that in our show notes when we publish the podcast. Uh, we'd really like to thank you for kind of taking the time. It's most enjoyable. Thanks very much. Uh, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And I'll be off to practice my incantations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks thank you. Bye. <laughs> hey, John, I really enjoyed that conversation with Ruth Cannon. And I'm curious to hear what stood out to you. Well, Martin, there's an awful lot there. And I, I think we were both drawn to that phrase, arcane and esoteric. Uh, Ruth was talking about what uh, what pulled her into uh, the interest in the law, the idea of mastering the arcane and esoteric elements of the law. And although I don't think of the law in terms of uh, magic or witchcraft or the occult, uh, we were using words from those worlds. Uh, we talked about legal spells, incantory phrases, and uh, the barrister's rite of passage, deviling. Yes, um, and I also enjoyed the speculation that floated around about the whole devil piece, whether that somehow was connected to the actual original site of the courts in Dublin, which is actually near Dublin Castle, it was an area of Dublin known as hell. So is hell related to the deviling part of the legal profession in Ireland? I don't know, but I found that to be an interesting area of speculation. But also I was drawn to the fact uh, about Ruth, as you know, is a very busy woman, but she's also made time to actually create a blog that embraces the history of the four courts and the legal profession in Ireland. And she's done so during a very difficult time, being the COVID time in Ireland, where all of her colleagues who were used to being in close quarters are now in a separate place. And so putting that blog together, telling the stories of the four courts has drawn the members of her profession more closely together. You know, Martin, she also uh, underscored uh, something unique in Irish law that I'd like to uh, remind people of. That was her shameless plug pointing us to IrelandForLaw.com. And it makes the strong case that Ireland, as the only English-speaking country in the EU, is becoming the go-to venue for international contracts and dispute resolution. So I, I want to remind people, take a look at Irelandforlaw.com. Hey folks, thanks for listening. If you like what we're doing, please leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts and aren't sure of how to post a review, we explain it all in our blog at irishstewpodcast.com. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahill O'Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com.